And we will welcome everybody officially to Beyond Words, Putting Fun First in AAC. And I'm just so excited about this evening. We have Stephanie Brajot, who is a speech pathologist in Athens, Ohio, and um, a LAMP enthusiast. And I'm so excited for you to learn how she has created this wonderful world for her clients. Jennifer Monahan is here, um, having served as her former uh, PRC Sotelo consultant, now plays another role with the company, but is um, part of the journey. And John Halloran, so we're just going to let it uh, go from here. Um, oh, housekeeping. Please use the Q&A if you have a question that you would like for Jenny or myself to notice, and we'll try to bring it into the conversation. So we'll look for the that in the Q&A, but you can also use the chat window. And exactly 24 hours after this moment, Zoom will send you an email with your certificate of attendance. And if you are watching this um, at a later time, we're so glad that you joined us. And if you would like to look for this in the future, um, those of you that are in attendance, it will be recorded and um, posted on our YouTube channel. So I am going to stop my share and then give the reins over to Stephanie okay. and I'm going to hide myself, but I will be here moderating the chat. And St Stephanie, as you get take the control, may the host to show, show your PowerPoint. She has these wonderful pictures and, and a few videos she's going to share. And she sent that to me today, and I got to preview it. It's amazing, uh, touching to see the, the children with the, with the animals and, uh, and being so engaged. I remember the first time we met was at a training some years ago, and then another training, and then you kept showing up at trainings and then people, some of the host people get to go out and see you in action. And I'm sad that I never got to do that. So I feel like a, this is a great know. opportunity. It, oh shoot. Let me get back to the beginning. It's a shame. Well, there's, it's never too late. <laughs> yes. You are always welcome. And we would love to have you down here. Um, okay. I think I, I think I've well, I, 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 I'll have to forgive me in advance. No, no, you're doing great, and it will help you if anything has trouble. And if you have technological pro technology problems, that's that's where Stephanie comes in and will help you. Or Jenny, don't don't trust me to help you out at all. <laughs> but I just want to thank you for doing this and sharing your experiences that's with absolutely. the kids and the families. So thank you, you go so take, much for uh, having me. And uh, my families are excited to be a part of this. They they are very happy and delighted to share these pictures and videos of their kids and. I mean, we all work really hard here. It's it's me, but I'm very much in collaboration with the parents. And um, yeah, we're, we're thrilled to be asked to do this. So um, it is my first webinar, so everyone bear with me. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I started Pivot Point Speech Therapy in 2020 after COVID and or during COVID, I guess, in the middle of it. And um, I'm so glad I did because it really gave me a chance to... Um, get out of a more uh, clinical and formal environment with kids and um, really explore more of a vision of what I always thought would be good for kids, um, sort of on my own terms and in my own way. And then just because of the parameters of COVID, it, it sort of evolved into um, what's become my dream job, my life's passion. And doing all the things that I always want, that I myself always wanted to do as a child, play with animals and be outside. <laughs> yes, yes. And blow bubbles. And like, it's all, I kind of made that my adulthood is all my childhood dreams. So it's ridiculous, but it is working. It's, I found a purpose and a function for it. Um, so I think it, I, I wanted to point out what was different about my practice. Um, things that make it a little bit unique, but things that could be adaptable in maybe smaller ways or other ways in other kinds of um, locations or contexts. Um, these are things that I've just pointed out that I think are make, the, the things that make it especially different. One is I very intentionally wanted a home-like environment. So that is the where the yurt idea comes in. I, I was... On a side note, I was able to stay in Mongolia for a while, a long time ago, and I got to live in a traditional yurt with a family. And I just love what it symbolized and the whole, um, how it played in their culture and things like that. And I said, one day I'm gonna have a yurt. So when I started developing the idea for Pivot Point, I said, this is where, this is, this is where it's gonna come in. So I, I don't have a traditional yurt, but that's where you get this um, 
building from. It's a round building, lots of windows, lots of natural light. Um, there's a couch, a table, a kitchen. Um, I kind of set up the camera here so you could sort of see. It just looks like a living room, and that's where I wanted. That's how I wanted it to look with every intention. I wanted people to come in here and feel embraced and and relaxed and calm and that there wasn't anything judgmental um, taking place, that we could just relax, all of us relax, the parents, myself, and the kids just relax and play, you know. Um, the other piece is I'm an animal nut, so it's we have a lot of animals, and I know how much animals have brought to my life, um, and so it's just it was just sort of a given always that I was going to have animals involved. Um, at least my um, therapy dog is behind the table, Duke, my golden retriever. Um, but I've also got horses and rabbits and sheep and I think that's everything. And I could have never imagined what a just incredible role those animals have played in my therapy. I could have never planned it. Um, working with the animals brings out a whole other side of the children that's just um it's it's kind of unreachable in other ways it it and it also like parents like animals it's it's um it's like an equalizer it sort of takes us really into another space mentally and emotionally and it's just been uh i, I can't imagine doing therapy without the animals in some way they're almost like my colleagues i joke about them as my colleagues sometimes um I also do a lot of focus on the sensory profile of each child, much more so than I ever did before. That's my dog trying to get up. <laughs> if you can hear his nails on the floor. Um, uh, I got DIR floor time certified during COVID and did a deep dive into floor time. And that's where my focus on the sensory profile and relationship-based approach comes into play. Um, and with that, uh, there's a big focus on co-regulating um, with the parents and the child. Co-regulation is a huge, I would say it's a cornerstone of what I do and what I'm trying to achieve with the kids and the parents on an individual basis. And then also co-regulation amongst the group. Um, well, Stephanie, that, just in case of parents listening, what do you mean co-regulation? Describe that a little more for me. Yeah. Co-regulation, um, gosh, it's so important. It's it is when both people are feeling um, emotionally safe with one another and sensory safe. And it, it's not such a, like about physical safety, but it's that um, you can let your guard down and you're, there's a back and forth. There's a, there's a balanced reciprocity. There's not me um, necessarily um, trying to be superior or the teacher or the leader. It's more of a collaborative um, relationship. It's a little bit about emotional attunement, um, reading each other's emotions, um, responding to each other's emotions. It's very subtle, um, but it's very important. So it's really important with my work in terms of when a child sees the parent is relaxed with me, that they've got a relaxed tone, they're speaking slowly, they they can laugh, they can play, they can, it really helps the child relax and play. And we sort of fold that child into our co-regulation between each other. Um, when you get really good at co-regulation, um, you can absolutely start, um, I mean, you're really impacting the child's behavior. You're getting them more regulated. Um, when they get, if they're getting overstimulated, if they're getting flooded about something or worried about something or, um, if they're very flat even, you know, they're, they're like a little bit low registering. Um, you can use your energy, the, the parent and I can use our energy to sort of bring them into an activity and increase the energy that's needed to, to do projects and things like that. Um, does that sort of explain it, co-regulation? Oh, I can't hear you, John. I can't hear you. Yeah, no, oh, it's perfect. Here. We talk about it a lot in lamp trainings about getting a person to an appropriate readiness to learn. That we can't learn when we're falling asleep, and we can't learn when we're excited or scared or or have fr fr or frightened. And exactly. what you, what you, you've created an environment where the where the whole team uh, gets themselves at a great arousal level for learning. And I just wanted to make sure people understood how important that is that you start there. 
So. Yeah, yeah. I, I kind of think about it uh, like a 180, 180 degree semicircle. If a child's overstimulated, it's sort of getting into a flooded space. Um, and if they're low registering, they're a little bit flat and hard to get interested in things. I, I try to keep them somewhere in that middle range, you know, and you can really move the child's dial with your own energy and your own, um, your own, uh, animate level of animation and, um, your own, your own interest in what you're doing. Um, it's really interesting. It's been really interesting. Um, sure. Perfect. I didn't mean to stop you there. I just wanted to. That's okay. I knew, I knew it was so important. I wanted to make sure you didn't. Everybody understood you were saying. So. Yeah. Perfect. Um, I have to let my dog out really quick. Hold on one second. <laughs> oh, I love it. That doesn't look like a year, but I, I, the, the, Sorry this, about that. I wish, I wish we could all get a virtual tour of the whole year, the whole setup. But uh, I know it doesn't do it justice. Where she's no, sitting. Right. If you were to tilt that camera up, that's where the 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 the, the yurt. If, yeah, Steph, can you do that? Can you even higher? Um, it. Oh. I'm afraid I'll unplug my computer yeah. together. That's all right. That's all right. All right. But yeah, we'll see more of it in the pictures. <laughs> yeah, there yeah. are some pictures of it. Yeah. Um. I personally fo also focus a lot on cognition. Um, I am fascinated with cognition and um, learning about learning and really focusing on how a child learns, how parents learn. Um, that's meant about learning about my own learning style and what facilitates my own learning. I'm always paying a lot of attention to that, especially in terms of LAMP, um, because I, I know what goes wrong when kids are in cognitive overload. And um, that's been something that's been really important to talk to parents about because they might not have had that experience in a while, you know, where they've had to learn something very, very new and they forget how quickly it can be to be overwhelmed. And we really want to pay attention to that cognitive overload piece because that will quickly impact your regulation and the child's willingness to take chances and to try. Um, cognitive overload can shut things down very quickly. And a lot of times that gets misunderstood as being stubborn, um, but I really don't think it's that. I think it's being overwhelmed with too much, uh, like whatever the child, whatever activity, you know, make a choice, learn the motor plan, throw rocks in the water. Like it's too much for some kids. So um, we'll talk more about that later, but um, whoops, I, let me go back, sorry. How do I go back? Um, oh, oh man, hold on. Go back, back. Oh man, I have to think of start over. Sorry guys, hang on. Hey, it's okay. We got reminded of some of those great pictures of the yurt. <clears throat> yes. Okay, let me try it again. Aha, it's not really doing what I wanted it to do. How do you control them? It's not listening to the arrows or anything. Wait. Oh, wait, here we go. I think I'm going the right direction. Um, all right, here we go, here we go. Okay, so these are just some pictures of the, the um, home-like nurturing environment. This is us carving pumpkins on the porch. We do, I try to do as many sensory things as I can with the kids around the holidays. We have a trick or treat out in the woods every year. That's been great. Um, like I said, this is just me and two little kids on the couch reading a story. This is part of that home-like environment um, that's been so important for helping me cultivate these, um, these really emotionally connected relationships with the kids and um, really facilitated that relationship-based approach. Um, we play outside a lot. This was just a hysterical picture. We were putting things down the tube on a hill. And then that little boy got the idea to put his legs inside the tubes. And you see this other boy, like thinking like, what happened to your legs? You know, it's just a lot of play. Um, many of the kids I see really never get to play with other kids. So whenever I can do group therapy and with two, up to two to four kids, um, that's been fantastic to see these little, um, burgeoning friendships and things like that. Um, this picture here is a really good picture of the space. It has a, a circular window at the top. Um, that's just traditional Mongolian style, but, um, 
big tall ceilings sometimes i'm standing up here and i'm blowing bubbles so that the bubbles are coming down and it's raining bubbles um i try to make use of the space in all ways possible in all dimensions um a few weeks ago i have a boy that's really into the movie up and i try to facilitate that i'm very much doing child-led play so we had been doing up for a while on sessions, but he made like a little Lego structure, like a box. And um, I had some balloons and I saw he was trying to attach balloons. So I went and got helium balloons and we figured out how to attach them to this little Lego structure. And then I would drop them from this balcony so that it would look like the house in with the balloons and up. Do you know what I'm talking about? That movie? Yeah. Oh, yes, yes. So perfect. He love that. I mean, those are the kinds of things that I can do in this space that I would never be able to do in a school or a clinic. Or I mean, maybe I could if I really thought about it. But this space just seems to lend itself to those sorts of ideas. Um, we're on the floor a lot. Um, as you can see, this is a mom here. Um, it's yeah, I can set up obstacle courses in here. We have the animals. We have the bunnies running around in here. Um, so 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 most of the time the parents attend the sessions parents are on every session yep every session or it can be a babysitter or a grandparent um but yes i'm never i'm never alone with the child because parent training is so essential to what i do um parents are with their kids more than me and i really want them to be carrying over what i do um or what what we find out that's working really well here i want them to continue doing that at home um <laughs> You know, for a, even if you're just can use some vi forms of video modeling to share some of your session with a parent, if they can't, like if you're seeing a kid in a school. But I do, I do love the fact that you're able to do that there. But for those who can't do it, there's still ways they can zoom in part of the session or re or record the session and share it or something. So yeah. They can carry that over. Yeah, and through my floor time training, I really learned the value of, um, there is a lot of information that I can glean just from a 30 second video. So I often tell people, if you're having some kind of difficulty at home with a transition or some kind of, um, you know, a behavior, I don't wanna say a, just something that's happening, you're not sure how to handle, you're not sure what's going on for the child and you wanna to try to understand it more, send me a 30 second video. I can glean a lot of information from even a 30 second vi uh, video on what may be dysregulating the child and what we need, to, what we can tweak to see if we can um, ease that situation for the child and the parent. So there, there's a lot that can be done with video. Um, that's how I, that's what I did in the beginning when COVID was still going, I did, uh, several months, it was all video, but it's not the video that I'm seeing other people do. It's really watching a parent and child play and um, giving the parent feedback on things they can try. Like, hey, what if you positioned him this way? Or what if you, you know, you have way too many toys. Let's think about stripping that down a little bit. Um, trying to get a sense of the child's sensory profile and then making some changes. And we had great success um, that way, even through video. So um, this, I know it's animal assisted therapy and these are just some of my favorite pictures over the years. I have, I had three sheep, now I have two, but it was incredible how much the sheep wanted to be a part of the kids play outside. So literally the sheep would be right with us playing with puzzles. Um, this uh, little white rabbit is cloudy. Um, this child loves cloudy. We've got, these were all rescue rabbits that I didn't even plan on keeping, but then decided to keep. Um, this little boy in the corner that I'm hugging, it was his first time ever on a horse. He was really nervous, um, but he was willing to do it. Um, there's another little boy in front of him that's laying on the pony. And um, this was just a really special moment because his mother did not think he was ever going to get near the horse. He was just afraid. He never had the experience before, but he had, you know, he trusted me. He trusted me. He trusted I was going to take care of him, that I wouldn't let go of him. And, um, that, that day was a really important, um, for, for his and my relationship. Um, I, this co-regulation piece and feeling safe with me, um, it's, it's invaluable. Um, it's really what makes kids want to take a chance with you when you're, when you're teaching LAMP and you're trying to teach them new things. Um, yeah, it, it's, 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 uh, 
the animals have been a huge part of developing that trust. Um, and there's Duke and a little guy. This Duke, this golden retriever at the bottom is always with me. Uh, hold on, I'm trying to switch the page. Now it's not working the way it worked. Where did it go? Okay. okay. Um, this uh, on the left here is my, my son. Um, this is just a picture from last week and um, his first time on the horse as well. And he's hitting horse and go and stop um, just to, to do things with the pony. Um, it was just really great, a great day. Another day with another rabbit. Um, this is a, a horse willow um, that I, I think I had told you about. Um, I don't know if you want me to tell that story. Yeah, oh, I'd, I'd really want you to tell the story, but... Uh, ah. um, the, the, yeah, it, 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 but you told it to me. I felt just like I have a connection to horses myself through my grandmother, who told me that she could she only trusts people who loved horses, and she she uh, so anyway. And horses really do have this ability to seem to sense your personality, and they know they they they, they respond good to people who who treat them really well. So anyway, all right. So yeah, tell your horse story. Well, this is this is the same um, little boy and my horse Willow. Um, he just, he always wanted to be on this horse. We, we would, we put all my pets names on the child's lamp device too. So when they want to go see that animal, you know, they'll hit their name and like, we know that that's the one they want to see. And, um, he always wanted to see Willow. She was a 27 year old mare. Um, he just couldn't get enough of her. He would just want to lay on her like the way he is there but the horse also would close her eyes she would also they were co-regulating with each other it was really amazing to watch um at any rate she got she got sick she was 27 she did develop cancer it was a slow going cancer and um you know we were really worried we knew where it was headed we didn't ever use the words dying or death around finley with the horse but you know we we did have to start limiting his time with her because she wasn't doing well. And eventually we did have to sadly put her to sleep. Um, we didn't really say much about it. Um, we just sort of said, no, nah, she's not available. We tried to just not really directly address it. Um, some months passed. I think, I think she passed away in August. And then in January, his own dog died. They had a mastiff that they loved. And it was also ill and they ended up having to put it to sleep. It was really sad. There was a lot of uh, upset in the family. But um, the wild thing about this experience was he was only four. He had just turned four right before Willow passed away. So a very new four. And when the dog had passed away, he would hit on, he, he would come in here for a week and every day hit Onyx, Willow, Love, Want or some order of that, want, love, onyx, willow, willow, love, want, onyx, you know, it was always those four words together, and his mother and I were just amazed, because even though we had not said anything about willow in about six months, he, you know, he knew, he had a very good understanding of what happened, and that those two animals, you know, were together or the same um, situation happened with them. And it was very, very moving. Um, you know, he was very emotionally connected to both of those animals and wanted to talk about it and wanted to talk to us about it. And that was just uh, for his age. I, I was just really um, just surprised that um, he could have so much um, emotional awareness um, about something that was not, the adults were not being um, overt about. So it was just a great learning experience for me. Um, yeah, and, and the word order, he got to use the words he wanted around that topic, which I think is so important. They get to say the, what they want to say and not necessarily what you wanted to say. So I, I sense yeah. that what you do is you, 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 do, you give, I, I remember this from our conversation, is that you do a lot of times you just listen to what they're wanting to, to communicate about. Uh, yes, through. all the time. Um, yeah, for me, it's very fun because I think of it like a puzzle or like a little mystery that I've got to solve. Um, yeah, and love and want together, the way he was using it, I thought it was an amazing example of the descriptive talking that I've learned about in lamp trainings. You know, we didn't have the word miss. Like, I, I'm sure maybe he was thinking, feeling, I miss Willow and Onyx. I'm not going to see them again. But we didn't have miss on there, but we had love and want. And 
I mean, that's pretty essentially miss um, in meaning and semantically speaking. So yeah, I, I loved his descriptive talking is something that I do a lot of. Um, for example, if um, let me think of an example. If, uh, if a child, uh, like, okay, let me think. I've, oh, I can't think of a good example off the top of my head, but I, I use descriptive talking. So if there's, um, let's say a kid is referring, wants to talk to me about Nemo. Um, yes, I could put Nemo on there. I could make a customized button, but what I would prefer to do is, um, say something like orange fish, you know, or, um, movie orange but I, I would like to do some kind of descriptive talking of what what my preference is um because the kids won't have access to that kind of specificity all the time so I think it's great and whatever word order that comes in is fantastic you know um I think it's a really good exercise for for them to do yeah that. yeah I I think it's a a byproduct of it. when you have a lot of words and you, you combine them in your own order the way you're thinking it then t also tells you what words to add so um it's a way for it's a way to guide you to knowing what words you need to be talking more about and adding to their device but that byproduct of giving somebody words and I, I think the way you model uh, on your devices i've seen in the videos before is just beautiful that you you, you do enough modeling so they see you using the device too to, to, to see how to use those words absolutely i i uh, can't stress enough that when i start with a new family the first thing i tell them one of the first things i tell them a lot of i kind of overload them in the beginning but i i tell them you are going to use it 10 times more than the child is you are going to use it you are going to model it way more than your child. Um, uh, that was something I learned um, with more experience, how important it is for the child to see both parents use it. My most successful children, they see everyone in the family use it. The grandma, the babysitter, mom, dad, the brothers, the sisters. Sometimes parents say, you know, should I let their brother and sister touch it? And I say, well, yeah, as long as it doesn't become a possessive sibling thing. But, you know, I, I wouldn't keep a sibling from using it because I think that's really good for, it just normalizes it and it helps it feel normal. Um, and then it facilitates a child's usage most of the time. Yeah. Um, hold on, let me, let me go on here. Yeah. Um, this is just, uh, this was, I kind of put this together for you, Jennifer, because you get, you got to see Ash. <laughs> I have my animal assisted therapy, but this is my Ash specific assisted therapy because I do have this one, this is all the same sheep and he is a really special sheep. I'll never have another sheep like him. He's just like my golden retriever, um, Duke. He thinks he's a golden retriever. Um, he's just been an amazing, um, stimulus for the kids to connect with. And, um, you know, I just, I just thought of this now. I've never thought about this before, but I do a lot with puppets and maybe the animals are like another extension of the success I have with puppets. You know, I, there's a lot of good research supporting, um, interacting with children with puppets and I've had a lot of great success with kids and puppets. And maybe this is a, like puppets come to life. Maybe this is why Ash is such a popular person here. Um, He's very charismatic. He's very um, following the kids around a lot. He's kind of relentlessly wanting attention. And um, I look at him and he's like a wise old soul. He's just staring at me in that middle picture. <laughs> yeah. you, you can stand on the deck of her yurt and just call his name and call his name. And you'll see kids even with apraxia that are just trying so hard to call his name. And lo and behold, he'll come over the hill every time. Yep. And They'll come I, over. Have, I have that video for us, Jen. Well, um, I have, I, so my auditory processing is a little bit off. I could have swore the little boy was saying ass. I thought, <laughs> he, was asking, I thought, he, was asking, I thought he was asking for the jackass. So there must have been a donkey out there. But anyway. I don't that's, think so. I don't think so. I, uh, well, we'll see. Yeah. Hold on. I'll get this video up here for you. This is the video that you are thinking of, Jen. Um, Yes, yes. Ah! <laughs> oh, so we will cut up carrots um, before we decide that we take them out and then we'll throw them for the fence for the animals. And...
He'll come running up for a second. Three. Ah, I see him. Here he comes. He hurt you. He's amazing. He's just really responsive. You know, if the kids call him, he will come. Oh. Ashy. Oh. Ah, so far. Ready? Yes. Okay. Okay. Go throw it. There it is. Ash. I know he is. Oh. <laughs> Should I give him more? It just gets kids so excited to, you know, okay. lots of kids have access to a dog or a cat, but a sheep <laughs> is <laughs> almost and, um, two or one. such a warm and friendly sheep. Um, two or just one. been such an asset here. Two. Let's give him two. Yeah. That's just one little video there. Um, go back. Um, this is another, um, this is what I was alluding to before with just the rabbits. Um, I'm calling her my bunny girl. Um, this little girl has been so affected by our work with rabbits and so motivated and she has developed so much speech and language around these rabbits. It's incredible. I, it's just been utterly fascinating. I could have never planned it in a million years. Um, honestly, my rabbits do act differently around her. They, they, they are very calm around her. Um, some other kids will come in. They're not quite behaving the same. She is very connected to these rabbits. I can't explain it really. Um, she <laughs> literally like two weeks ago, see that toy doctor kit here in the black and white picture. She, we, she's become, we have this little routine where she pretends to be their doctor. And I'm honest, I need to get a video of it because it sounds unbelievable, but the rabbit will very calmly let her put a toy thermometer in its mouth. And she's very careful with it. And the rabbit doesn't run or, you know, the first time I saw her do it, I was like, the rabbit's never going to tolerate this, but it just is like, okay, it's, it's her. I'll let her do it. You know, um, she listens to their heart. We, we have to give all the rabbits like a doctor's exam. Um, she, uh, we've developed songs around the rabbit. We've turned twinkle, twinkle, little star into, um, bunny bunny i love you you know and things like that um which is carried over to the music therapy that i also do here um with the with the music therapist um yeah it's just been uh amazing and this is i have a picture of her lamp device up there that is a sentence that she put on there herself one day she just came in and put that right on lamp and it's always the first thing she wants to do when she gets here is see the brown bunny, see the white bunny, see the black and white bunny. And then we go through our routines and she wants to be bunny doctor, bunny dentist. We sing the song. I mean, we have so many, we've developed so many routines around caring for the rabbits and playing with the rabbits. Um, and these rabbits are amazing. I mean, you can see them in the bowl there and it's just, they're very, um, they're very okay with her doing all of this um she likes to cut up fruit and vegetables for them and we there's a lot of activities we um she'll put apple and carrots and things like that apple carrots bunny things like that on lamp um completely independently she's so motivated to be with these rabbits that i mean i don't even have to i mean she just does it on her own and that is what i'm always looking for is a child to independently use lamp um, if a child isn't independently used lamp, I've got to figure out why. Um, I try to give kids the least amount of assistance possible in every session um, because we want them to be independently talking. Um, no, I have I, my I, own yeah. sort of hierarchy for that um, in my mind. Uh, so Stephanie, there's something you said that I've, I've learned through the years. You said when they're not using it, I have to learn. You, you, put, you put it on yourself. You blamed you said I have to find another way. I have to find something to do, find something. 
way to reach them another way or something. And, oh, and uh, all good therapists live in guilt uh, that they're, they need to be doing something different. But um, I, I love the way you, you, do, you don't put it, the student's not able to learn or the team isn't willing to carry it over. You, you say, what do I have to do different? And what yeah. can I bring to them? Not, not every school has a rabbit, but uh, or everybody's going to have a rabbit, but you can find something in your environment that they have a passion for. Uh, if you just open your mind up to listening to what they're what they're showing you, they want to engage with. So that's right. You know, a perfect example of that is um, I have a little boy that's really into Lion King. I've been doing a variation of Lion King with him almost every session for about five months now. I am, I, I, <laughs> I do find a way to put another spin, some kind of spin on it um every time i mean it's 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 a lot about being creative and about um you have to be i think i told you earlier i never have an agenda with the kids i really let the kids leave lead the agenda i have lots of ideas in my mind that i could come up with quickly or like i'll have a template of an idea a play idea in my mind but i'll adapt it to the lion king or to rabbits or something like that um but i very much let the children lead the play and then I'm trying to be very um spontaneous and creative in the way that I I want I tell myself I need to facilitate their ideas um I'm a facilitator I'm not telling them how to play I'm not directing the play I want to facilitate their ideas so um that that and that's very much something I do with my words and my body language but I, I do it very much energetically too just um waiting just waiting and being um there's a phrase um in floor time called wait watch and wonder and i really uh promote that with the parents just wait watch and wonder when a child walks in i i can't jump into it to my agenda um i need to see i need to ask a lot of questions did they sleep well last night did they eat this morning are they in a good mood you know like what's and then let them kind of transition at their own pace into the space and I'm just watching them and sort of getting talking to chit chatting with the parent a little bit on how their day is going or how the last few days have been. And then I'm seeing what they gravitate towards. And I mean, I know my toys very well and I don't put out toys that I can't make something um, work between the two of us. If that makes what, sense. What, what about predetermining voc vocabulary you're going to teach? How much structure do you have around? No, I, I really don't. I don't, um, I really work on what they, what's meaningful to them. And on that day, that that's where I have the most success. It has to be, it's about salience, right? Like how much, I mean, that's how it works for me anyways, just whatever they are feeling passionate about or interested in or curious in that day, that's the, that's the vocabulary I'm going to. Well, I'm glad to hear it because I, I keep I keep seeing us have these lists of words we're going to teach during the next week or the next session, and I think that, I think it just needs to be more open. Following the child's lead, how many words yeah. this hour can I introduce? And, and, and it's core and fringe words simultaneously, and so I think that's yeah. one of the tricks you have is you're you're very child centered, but you're also so don't take this wrong. You're so unorganized that you don't know what word's going to come up next, which is what I, what I want people to learn from you is to just let that happen and follow their lead. So yes, that is so funny you say that because that is um, one of my qualities that makes a lot of people crazy. I have received a lot of negative feedback about appearing unorganized to the untrained eye. I like to think of it, but I I have to keep it loose to here to be able to be spontaneous and creative. If I'm approaching a child with I'm going to get through this list of words today, then I'm already coming in with an agenda. You can't do child-led therapy and have an agenda. It just doesn't work. You can't really do relationship-based child-led play and say, I have an agenda because you will always be somehow projecting pressure on that child. Um, the most important thing that I do that I think a lot of other people don't do yet is I never let the child think that lamp is more important to me or word counts are more important to me than having fun with that child. Keep it, keep going. Yeah, if you, if that child starts to think for one second that, oh, is this about you getting through something with me? Is this about you like moving through some agenda that means nothing to me? You will lose them in the play. They, they won't be as engaged. 
you can get them to do stuff, but they won't, their heart won't be in it. And if their heart's not in it, then you're not going to get the independent usage of trying to express themselves that I'm, that's, that's my ultimate goal is that they will independently um, express whatever their idea is. I mean, I encourage people to say, um, I don't like it, you know, <laughs> if they don't like my idea or they think, you know, whatever I'm suggesting is not great, then I welcome that too. You know, um, I, I, I think I may have mentioned this to you before. I'm sure I've told Jen, I, I am very good at what I do, but I, it, half of it is because I've gotten excellent training and I've sought excellent training and I have been, um, very receptive to feedback and critique and trying to work with that. And the other reason, the other 50% is just from making a lot of mistakes and flailing through something and trying something and it doesn't work. Try something else. See, see if it works. Um, and every child is different too, but um, that's, that has been one of the biggest lessons I've learned through both training and flailing is if the child thinks that, that and they know you cannot fake it, you really can't fake it. They will always know if you are really hiding the agenda, um, these kids are super smart. They're very perceptive. And um, man, I, I've really learned in this environment just how perceptive they are. I mean, it's, I have, I learn from these kids every week. Um, so yeah, I, I don't, uh, I may look unorganized to some people, but I know exactly what I'm doing. And <laughs> no, I, I mean, it in a positive. I mean it in a positive way. Yeah. You let you let the flow of the moment lead what vocabulary you're going to teach. And, yeah. and I, I think that's really one of the key to successes is people immerse the children with lots of words at one time, not not memorizing words or word order, but immersing them in the words that the child wishes they could say when they want to say it. And that in return develops that trust with you. And then the, then they're not a more appropriate readiness to learn. So you've you're establishing that first thing about making that social connection. Yeah. It's a, it's a very emotional connection, a social emotional connection. It, you know, for me, I feel like at the end of a session, if that child looked at me, like, I really like you. If they just looked at me and didn't even use lamp or they didn't like say anything verbal. If they, if, if I'm leaving the end of a session feeling like they care about me or they don't want to leave, to me, that's like an A plus. I mean, we are we are doing we are doing good. We are doing the right thing. Um, if they if they do use lamp and, and talk on top of that, that's fantastic. But I really do love, you know, sometimes I'll say to a mom, you know, okay, maybe we didn't get as much lamp as we wanted to today, but wow, did you see the way that he looked at me and how long he looked at me and he really like connected with me and how much he took turns with me? and you know stayed with me so many circles of communication um that to me is far more important than how many uh, yeah many stephanie people. i think when we're keeping taking data sometimes you know if a parent's in the room and we're watching i think we're driven to show more and more repetitions and more and more communication acts when really the quality of the exchange uh, was 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 more valuable than the number of exchanges and yes. you you've you're, you're showing the parent that accepting their verbals, their nonverbal speech or their non their, their gestures or their eyes or their pointing is just as important. And by by showing them, by modeling that, it, it then makes the child more willing to, to learn the device when you want to show them what, where that word is a more formal way. So I, I think you, yeah. I, I'll add that sometimes parents have such a strong love language that they read the child so well that it takes years before the device is needed with them. But yeah. they can model, they can model and cast back and expand the kid's utterance. But the, some of these parents have a love language that's so effective that that uh, the child has a look in the face and the mom says he's getting angry, or he needs to go to the restroom or something. Like you, you and I can't see that. Uh, yeah. we're, we're not yeah. we're not there yet. Yeah, yeah. That's another reason why I love having the parents with me, because when when they see when they can give me that kind of insider information, I say, oh, okay, now it makes sense. Well, then, yeah, let's let him go to the bathroom or let's, yeah, I'm not doing it the right way, the way that he likes it. I mean, that's super, no one knows the child better than their parent. Um, and I, I think of the parent as a real, having a real asset, you know, they're, they're like my, um, I mean, they're, they're a great source of information for me. Um, 
on what makes the child tick, what's what's uncomfortable to them or what really drives them in a positive way. Um, they're full of information. Um, I don't think parents are involved in therapy enough. Um, I I think that there is a space to think of them as a little bit, you know, in, as collaborators in trying to facilitate a child's um, communication um, because we both want that. Um, I hope that I'm able to articulate for parents um, the meaning and the value of all that nonverbal communication because it's very powerful. It's very powerful. And I'll show you a video at the end to <laughs> exemplify that. Um, but uh, yeah, I um, I wanted to show you this little video I have here. Um, let me see if I can pull it up here of, of uh, this little girl. Um, this is from uh, a video from her parents. Um, it was based on the bunny things. And um, one day, this is, she really wasn't doing a lot of spontaneous speech yet, but I just spontaneously sung it in a scale. I said, I love, 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 love bunnies. And for whatever reason, she thought that was hilarious. And um, she grabbed onto that and it took her a couple days, but um, she started saying it at home and the parents just loved it. it it really did start with her sincere love of bunnies and then you'll see what she does with the phrase here with her dad oh. my daddy <laughs> <laughs> She could do it many, many times. But, um, I you know, she, she, uh, she's very, um, my daddy. <laughs> um, she, this was a level of animation they had never seen in her before, you know, um, and that, that's what was really special to them about this. Um, she definitely, I, there's a, I'm doing a lot of apraxia kind of work embedded in everything as well. She definitely benefited from this hand movement going up a scale. I've noticed that um, a lot of my kids really tune into a scale up or a scale down. So that was one of the things I was trying with her that day. And I think that's an interesting thing. Uh, we could probably go off on another tangent about apraxia speech. One of the deficits is that they have difficulty with intonation and imitating intonation. So I try to work in um, some scales up and down whenever I can and with, with songs or chants or things like that. But I, I make them up um, depending on the child's interest, you know? So um, that's why her parents are moving their arms up because she is following it. Um, she's getting the different pitch. She was very monotone before. So this pitch practice sort of um has been really helpful um but a few times in there she was changing it to i love 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 daddy i love 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 mommy and she started doing that on her own just sort of switching out words and um i thought that was really neat um, uh, and I, th I think she was teasing him by saying bunny instead of mommy or daddy yeah yeah i think, I think so it was a high level of social exchange. I'm going to tease daddy and giggle about it. So yes, you know, it's just, yes, just, a yes. just a genius little video. Yeah, she, she's a great kid. Um, whenever she sees me, she'll come up to me and she'll say, buh, 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 because that is the sound of the bunny's heartbeat when we're playing bunny doctor. And um, it's just been, she's been a riot. Um, but again, I've learned so much from this little girl. Um, this is just, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the sensory profile. That's a little bit of the DIR floor time training coming in. I spend a lot of time thinking about the child's sensory profile and, 
uh, with um, floor time, in addition to the five senses, you have um, vestibular, interoception, and proprioception. Um, uh, and I'm also thinking a lot about visual spatial um, skills with these kids because they're so visually driven. Um, I try to build a lot of activities around different sensory profiles and try to find good overlaps um, with those interests and activities. So this one on the left, we've been talking about bees a lot lately. So I bought a honeycomb and they're getting to touch it and play with it and play with the beeswax and taste the honey. And it's very messy, but it's just part of it. Um, this was a really fun uh, little activity. Um, I encourage the parents to do it too. It's so funny how um, I'll have kids that don't like sticky things or like they don't like their hands wet, but then I find out the parents are the same way. <laughs> And the, there's a lot of sensory overlap in the parents sometimes where I'm like, oh, okay. So it's not just his little quirk. It's, it's, it's in the family, that little quirk. Um, it's good information. Um, we all have different, we all have a sensory profile, all of us. How, how, how long are your sessions? Are they, they typically? My sessions are typically an hour and a half. Um, and most of the kids you see in the pictures here, I see them three times a week for an hour and a half. So it's like five to six hours a week. Um, some of that is in one-on-one. -on -one. Some of that is in a small group, maybe two kids, three kids or four kids. Um, some of that is um, on field trips. I have a group of four that I take on a field trip every Thursday. Um, almost all my kids get uh, 35 minutes of music therapy per week. Um, so there's a lot in that five to six hours. Um, but I try to make sure that everyone has some individual therapy and group work with a peer, a well-matched peer. Um, so, yeah. Um, we do a lot with bubbles. I have three or four different bubble machines, of course, but you know, it's not just bubbles. It's, I will not do a, I want to say this about sensory work. There's sensory play and there's more imaginative play. This is my opinion. Like it's probably mishmash from a lot of different trainings or experience, but there's sensory play and there's imaginary play. Um, when I start working with a new three or three or four year old, and it's it tends to be very sensory oriented, just jumping on a trampoline, jumping, 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 jumping for the sake of jumping. It's very hard to break into relationally, apart from just bringing out the trampoline, and then and then it's hard to connect with them after that. Um, unless you're joining them on the trampoline or something like that. What I try to do is I, I almost never let a child just purely dive into a sensory activity without me. If we're not in it together, I'm probably going to finagle it so it doesn't really happen. For example, I will let a person go on a trampoline. That's not the problem. But I always am trying to build a narrative around it. So, um, for example, with the trampoline, it's not just going to be jumping mindlessly on the trampoline for the sensation of the trampoline. It's going to be 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, blast off. And then I'll pick them up and I'll throw them on the couch, you know, and then they'll ask me to do it again. So it's got some kind of context, some kinds of playful reciprocity. Um, that has been really important to what I do. Yes. Or are you going to ask me something? Oh, no, I was just so happy I was doing a high five. Oh, okay. I, <laughs> I was doing a yeah. speak and say louder. But yeah. you know what, I, what I'm worried about is I, I want these questions, some of these, Stephanie, um, but I, if you have your, we're going to run out of time. Okay. I want you to take your most important things left that you, a video or something you want to share okay. and then get ready for a few questions, just a few anyway. And Stephanie, you look through and see if you can scan through the most important questions. Okay. Or, okay repeated uh, okay. not, but we otherwise we could go on forever but this is just exactly what i wanted you to do is just show us your heart and passion for what you do so okay uh this is just like i wanted to say i do a lot of steam activities that revolve around cognition problem solving planning sequencing memory um this is an example of somebody just telling me they want to color and draw um cooking this is a lot of time outside in nature i could say a lot more about this but it's kind of speaks for itself um, these are some of the field trips that we do. Um, we try to stay as much together as we can at each place. I put up a lamp board at our local library with Jennifer's help. Uh, a few other people there. That's been, that was us uh, looking at it when it first came out. Um, let me show you. Um, 
this one is about four minutes. Is that okay? Okay. Um, I'll just set this up a little bit. I thought this was a good one because this was my third session with this child and he was, um, very much non-speaking. He had some medical, um, unfortunate things happen, um, earlier in his life. Um, he had got the autism diagnosis. He was told, you know, never going to talk. He's never going to go to school. It is a very negative picture, very, very negative picture from the, um, uh, nationwide children's hospital. Um, this was our third session. Again, I, I just want to point out that in the first few sessions, I myself am only modeling, modeling, modeling. I don't put any expectation on the child to use it at all. If they go ahead and use it, great. But if not, that's great too. It's not my intention that they are using it. I don't put that kind of pressure energetically in the room. Um, this is me at the end of teaching the word turn. Um, so I'm turning him a lot physically and then it does uh, move into bubbles, but it was just an amazing session because um, he put two words together on his own independently in the middle of this session without any direct instruction whatsoever. So that was it was such a great moment for us. He started to grip me like, I'm not down. <laughs> Woo! Turn, 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 turn. This is a big smile. Turn. <laughs> A lot of the sense no, I know he loves vestibular in input. Wow. And this is my vestibular turn, turn, turn. Um, you test, you know, to bring him into the play. Turn, turn. Here we go. Turn. important to have these pauses, these silent pauses. Let the child process, let them think about what happened, where what's going to happen next. I'm sitting waiting to see where he's going to lead us next. device at this so on this day much. so much again i'm using scales and giving him the profile so that goes up his chest with that much. bottle at the same time you love bubbles I just want to say one thing here real quick. I never like say, oh my gosh, that's so great. You use lamp. I never, that will wreck progress. I, I tell parents, you have to stay very calm when they do this. Um, it'll, it'll even praise can feel like pressure is my point. Um, so yeah, we were good on this. Wow. Wow. Mom, I saw the mom's reaction was crying. 
That's incredible. Crying, she's so happy. Oh, you guys, I'm so honored to be part of it. He's totally, you're making me cry. He is totally capable. Yeah, they had he, there is no way that he's not capable. Like, you're making me cry. Yeah. Oh, you guys, I'm so honored to be part of it. And he's totally capable. Yeah, they had just there is a full fledged Elon Musk here. Awesome. He is brilliant. He's brilliant. And don't let anybody ever tell you different from this point forward. Okay? <laughs> yeah. That's oh. never <laughs> happened. <laughs> Two words together. Third session. That doesn't happen. That's incredible. Great. I love you. Yeah. Three words. That's incredible. <laughs> I love um, you. We have a lot of tears. Yeah, that is incredible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We yeah. We we cry here sometimes. It definitely happens. <laughs> it definitely. I I guess. Um. I mean, I've seen the video a lot, and I know the family very well. Um. I think I think I'm seeing myself just um. I'm not, I'm much more emphasizing the fun that's between us, between the child and me there, than whether I care about Lamp or not. And so, um, I think it comes so I saw a parent or someone reply that it was just what they needed to hear there. It was just perfect what you showed there. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, 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 little, the little boy going over and hugging his mom afterwards, just showing the intrinsic pride and that I, he, he was showing, I just said it, didn't I, Mommy? So it, it was just perfect. Yeah, the parents don't get anywhere near enough credit. And these hospitals, when they give them the diagnosis, it's so negative and so depressing and hopeless. And when I read a report, you know, uh, about a child, I just think, who are they talking about? This is not the child that I know. This mm. is some other kid that it doesn't resemble the child I know at all. And um, it's just, uh, it's, it's really important that the parents get through that evaluation and then never think about it again if it's been an unpleasant experience because those people cannot predict anything about what their child is going to do or not going to do. Um, not, I don't know one single child that I've worked with that's, that's um, not had all the wonderful things happen nothing nothing that the hospital said comes true so sure. i definitely want to tell people to not listen to what the assessment team says yeah i, mean, I, I think that, i point think point. that i think the children and the parents know you believe in them and they rise up to that so yeah, i think if they, they sense when you don't think they can do something and they and they don't don't give it to you then so perfect yeah. stephanie do you have a question there too for stephanie with a p Oh, you're on there you go yes no uh, i think um jenny and i have gotten a number of questions answered in the background there was a question oh. that we asked that might be helpful you addressed it a little bit but stephanie what are some of the specific things you do or say um, to help parents feel more comfortable using the vocabulary and the devices um well when I'm starting off a new family, I mean, I'm only starting with two or three words. You know, I, it's very, um, I don't want to load, overload the parent either. I don't want to cognitively overload a parent. Like I actually, what I really need to do is help the parent cultivate a relationship with LAMP before I, it, 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 at the same time as the child. I'm really trying to, it, it's, it's very much the same kind of technique with the child. I'm trying to show the parent that this is doable that yes it's new it's a new way of thinking about things but it's absolutely doable and it's my job to make it feel easy and if it's not feeling and I'll, I'll just tell them that directly if this doesn't feel easy you must tell me and i will get to the bottom of why either i'm giving you too much information or i'm not giving you a good example or i'm not addressing the thing that is most impactful in your life um and i'm I kind of start there, I guess, and yeah, I, I gotta, I gotta say, Stephanie, that's you said I, I have to build a relationship with the parent first, and uh, th that's just genius on your part. Do you have the video where I saw you using the word finder feature? Yes, I saw. Uh, you can uh, yes, it's it. for this one. We were doing dinosaur birthday party. Light um, it up. I not remember where the word light, light was. it up. So now you're using word finder to find the word, but then the child gets to touch it. Mm -hmm. Like it. And I'm just saying it. I'm not. 
quite deep even. Mm. Uh, I'm always trying to give the least amount of help possible. Like this. Oh. Good. Yeah, put it together. I'll put it together. I'll put it together. Okay. I'm going to light it up. Here we go. Party. So we made a last chapter. It's your day. Hey, one, two, three. Happy, happy birthday. Come here, Velociraptor. Get close to your cake. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Velociraptor. Happy birthday to you. Make a wish. Make a wish. <laughs> oh, it's so good. Well, I can Okay. Make a wish for Beautiful. I wish I'm a pet dragon. He wishes he had a pet dragon. He says. Pet dragon. He says. And ow. Um. Why and ow? So. I'm so. Why and ow? Right now. Excited. I'm so excited. I'm so excited. I'm so excited. I'm so excited. That's been a little fun thing is to let the kids think that the puppets are using lamp or that Duke is using lamp or that these dinosaurs are using lamp. Um, that's been a very playful way to model lamp that isn't me or the mom or anything like that. And I'll say, I just remember now watching this, um, she was obsessed with those dinosaurs and I was just getting kind of bored with it myself. But she had also been saying this happy birthday script from a show. And so I just got the idea to blend them. I was like, okay, why don't we um, we'll work with dinosaurs, but let's have a dinosaur birthday party. And so that's kind of my the spontaneous, unorganized, uh, creative stuff that I'm doing on the spot and, and following the child's lead. That's where like, I won't, you know, I'm taking her, even though I don't really want to do dinosaurs, like, okay, we're going to do dinosaurs, but let's give it a tweak. Let's do something different with dinosaurs today. You mentioned birthday party. Let's have a dinosaur birthday party. Uh, and then the candles kind of add to the sensory experience of it. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I use WordFinder a lot. And I also have, um, getting back to the parents, I definitely support the parents learning, showing them how to use WordFinder and encouraging them to use WordFinder a lot. And occasionally mm -hmm. I'll give a parent a pop quiz and I'll say, show me where happy is. And oh. they hate when I do that. But I think it's important because, you know, if you, um, I mean, I do it nicely, playfully, but. Well, <laughs> of course you do. Stephanie, you, you did it. This presentation was so powerful and I hope everyone sees your, you can feel your passion for what you do. You can hear it. You can feel it. It's obvious. And I, I, I know lots of others out there like you, but I hope you know how much we appreciate you helping inspire others to be a little more child-centered and play-based and helping kids learn language in a fun environment and generalize that across environments. So you did a beautiful job. Thank you for sharing. Thank you very much. Thank you. It is, it is my passion. I, I can't see myself doing anything else in any other way than the way I'm doing it now. I just hope a bunch of families aren't moving to your hometown there. So they get their kid <laughs> in your clinic. I hope I wish I could find help. It's very, you know, it's been very hard for me to to hire help um to 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 work with me. Uh just to find some one that wants to work in this um this way that I'm kind of thinking outside the box about things. Um yeah. not everyone loves it but it definitely works and um yeah. there could be a yurt in every town that had a person just like you to help spread that <laughs> love it'd be great so yeah, it really would be great but I, I think you did a good job of, of what you did tonight will help spread that message and help people be you follow your lead even more than you think so we learned from each other and you did a great job teaching us tonight so thank, thank you I'm, I'm so grateful to have this opportunity thank you so much uh, it's, it's a, it's an amazing device and it really does change lives. It really can change so much for the better. Um, when it's done well, 
Um, it, it can move mountains and really change the whole landscape for years to come for between parents and children. Um, yeah. All right. We thank you again, Stephanie Olson. Thank you for helping Jennifer Monahan. Thank you for being here. You, thank she's you. your, she's your biggest promoter when you're, when you're not around, she, <laughs> she wants everybody to go see the yurt and see your animals. And eggs. <laughs> so. Well, this was such a pleasure. Thank you everybody for coming tonight. Um, especially to our guest, Stephanie. Um, so until next time, everybody have a good night. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. We're all we're good. <laughs> Great job. Great job, Steph. Are we off the the people are gone? I, I no, they might still be there. You <laughs> just assume just assume you have a live mic always, but you did just a wonderful job. <laughs> Uh, we, you, you did just what I wanted you. We didn't follow our script. I didn't answer your questions. You just spoke from the heart and it was beautiful. So I think it was better than we could have imagined. So, congrats. so well I truly done. do. I, I truly do wish just everyone could even spend 15 minutes there. It's like, mm -hmm. it is magical. It's life changing and it's just real and authentic. And it's uh, like, it's not rocket science. It's just, it's words and keeping it real, you know? Yeah. Yeah, uh, we, we make it. We 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 make we make what should be fun and play and and follow yeah. the kids. Lead. We make it. We make it ugly somehow, but yeah. overcomplicate but, it. Overcomplicate yes. it. Yes. But yeah. I didn't. I didn't bring it out overtly tonight, but I. You know, it's so much of that. I've learned to. I've learned where my ego, my own ego, has been such a huge obstacle to my own development and learning. You know, um, getting away from relationship based stuff, going in, getting into worrying about like, are they doing it the way I want them to do it? So I don't look stupid. You know, and when I was younger, I was like, oh, the parent's going to think I look ineffective or like, I don't know what I'm doing. I was way too preoccupied with those more ego centered kind of thoughts. And, um, and now I'm, I'm, I'm less so. <laughs> well, yeah, but, well, yeah. you, uh, you're, you have a very good presence. So thank you again for sharing your, your what you've been doing. I can't thank you. All all right. Right. Uh, yeah. Well, we, remember I told you when the lamp position comes open, you're you're first on the call list. So I'll be there right. when and where I'm, I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to create a position that'd be worth it. All right. Thank you. All right. All right. All right, guys. Have a good rest of the week. All righty. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.